Good evening, candidates, and good evening to our audience. Uh, this is uh, SPNN, our St. Paul Neighborhood Network, hosting the Ward 2 uh, Forum tonight with the three candidates who are here. There's one who is not here tonight. Uh, we've got uh, Ms. Uh, Novell Knorr did not make it, but she called late after she didn't do her questionnaire responses and said she'd like to participate, but we had a cutoff date. I want to thank you all for your thoughtful responses in the questionnaire. And I want to uh, thank SPNN for hosting this. And I also want to tell our audience that uh, you can go to St. Paul Strong, uh, spelled out one word, stpaulstrong.com, and see the questionnaire responses that the three candidates have submitted, uh, in addition to hearing what they have to say here tonight. My name is Andy Dawkins. I was a state representative for 15 years and an unsuccessful candidate for mayor in 1993. My name is Abu Naim. I'm a former St. Paul uh, Ward 1 uh, City Council candidate, and I'm also a board member of the Hamlin Midway Coalition. I'd also like to introduce St. Paul Strong. Uh, we've been around for a little while. We believe in transparency and accountability in city government, and uh, we don't endorse anyone. Uh, we're neutral on who should be the best candidate and who should be the winner. Uh, there'll be no opening statements tonight. We're going to alternate who answers uh, the questions first. So uh, we'll start with uh, the first question. We'll go to uh, our candidate, Rebecca Necker, who is sitting in chair one. So Ms. Necker, you've just knocked on my door. You've got 20 seconds to tell me why I should vote for you. Well. First of all, thanks so much for hosting this forum tonight, although I wouldn't say that if I were at your door. Uh, I would say I believe in St. Paul, and I believe in getting things done. And I've been working hard for the last eight years to make our neighborhood safer, to make it easier for working families to get by in St. Paul, and to be accessible and responsive to my constituents. And that's the kind of work that I want to keep doing. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hasco. Repeat the question. I, was, I wasn't sure if it was going to change with each person. Ah, okay. You just knocked on my door. You've got 20 seconds to tell me why I should vote for you. Oh, my gosh. This is my hometown, and I care about it. Uh, I've been a business owner in this city for 30 years now. Uh, I think the direction of St. Paul is not exactly going in a positive direction. Uh, we just had another property tax levy increase. Transit's as unsafe as I've ever seen it. Downtown, there's a lot of neglect. Private businesses are still leaving the city. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thank Mr. You. Butler. Sure. Hello. Thank you for opening your door to me. I'm running because this is a very important election, and this is about returning the city to direct services for its citizens and not other uh, issues that are not uh, likely to be resolved at the city government level. Thank you. Okay, question number two, and this time we'll start with Mr. Hosko, Bill Hosko. So uh, you're out visiting a relative in rural Minnesota, and your uncle asks you, why do you like living in St. Paul? I like this format better than the League of Women Voters. It's a lot, it's a lot uh, quicker. I think I've traveled most of America, and actually a good part of the world, and there's no city in America like St. Paul. Geographically, the breadth of architecture here is really... I don't know if it's surpassed anywhere else in America. The history here, St. Paul being the headwaters of the navigable Mississippi River, going back to riverboat days and the start of the railroads here, the history in St. Paul is actually unique in America as well. Thank you. I'm not sure how long, we, how long do you give us to speak? Well, I think once you've finished a statement, I'll probably be, move on to the next person. We, we got a lot of questions, so. Okay. But you go ahead for another half. 20, 15 seconds. I don't know. You, you cut me off in my inter, intro statement, so I wasn't sure how long we, we were no, giving No, the 20 us. seconds one is just the first one. Go ahead. If you want to continue on your answer, <laughs> what, what you're telling your uncle. You know, there's a lot of potential here. That's not being met. I've been downtown. I recently moved out of downtown to West 7th Street uh, with an art gallery and a frame shop. There's so much potential here that isn't being met. And if I'm elected, we're going to achieve it. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Butler. Uncle, you're getting older. You can't live out in the farm anymore. We've got a lot of range of housing options in St. Paul. Uh, new, beautiful area opened up on the old Ford plant. It's got a lot of green space. It's got uh, assisted living services when you need them, and you can walk to various stores, parks, and along the river, as well as there are a number of cultural amenities, both in St. Paul and Minneapolis. So, and you won't feel like you're in a big city. Um, it, it's still quiet at night. There's still wildlife. And again, a lot of uh, open space to enjoy. 
Ms. Necker. of our natural resources, our civic and cultural resources, our history, but more importantly than anything else, you can be in St. Paul and feel like you are in a small town in a big city. It truly has the best of both to offer. And I just love the fact that wherever I am in St. Paul, when I'm walking down the street, going to a coffee shop, going to the library, going to a park, I'm always going to run into someone I know. And that social capital, those thick networks of connections between us here in St. Paul, that's what allows us to outperform other cities our size and even larger again and again. And it's one of the things that makes me so happy to live here. And I think you should move. Hmm. All right. Uh, this question, uh, first starting with Peter, uh, what is the least favorite thing about living in St. Paul? The least uh, favorite thing is the increasing in property taxes. It typically goes up every year. It can depend on how the market values are, but as a uh, resident, you will see at least single digit, maybe sometimes double digit property taxes. We're unfortunately a very property poor city, and as the tax, uh, property tax has to be increased every year, it's gonna fall on mostly residents because our downtown is in what's called a tax instrument financing district. So the all the value of downtown is really not benefiting the general property tax uh, revenues. Thank you, Ms. Necker. My least favorite thing about living in St. Paul is the condition of our streets. They are abysmal, they are embarrassing. Uh, every time I drive over them, I get angrier and angrier at their condition and more resolved to do something about it. Mr. Askell. Well, I'm running for, <laughs> I'm running for city council, so I'm not uh, too pleased with, I get a question. That light just went off. When the light goes off for a moment, do I look somewhere else or do I keep looking? No, you should be looking at the camera. Okay, the light went off a moment ago. It's uh, I'm not impressed with City Hall. I've been here for 30 years, as I mentioned, downtown. Just moved down to West 7th Street. Crime has become normalized here. Transit's as bad as it's ever been, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, City Hall just levied another property tax increase. Uh, the 1% sales tax referendum that's being uh, foisted upon us and threatened us, if we don't approve it, there'll be another property tax increase. Uh, existing tax revenues are for road repair. Uh, I could have quite a lengthy list, but I'll stop right there. Okay, thank you. Now, I think Ms. Necker's turn to go first on this question. Um, so tell me and my co-moderator, Mr. Naeem, uh, something that lets us know that you get it in your gut about racism. Something that <clears throat> lets you know that I get it in my gut about racism um, is the way that I interact with my constituents and make an effort to hear their experiences firsthand. I have experience personally being a religious minority. I'm an observant Jew, and so I know what it's like to not fit in in a number of ways, to not have the society around me be built for me or respond to me. Um, but that's only one experience, and there are so many different forms of diversity, racial, religious, spiritual, ethnic, income level, ability, sexual orientation all around us. And so I, I never try to presume that my experience of otherness is going to apply to someone else. So what I try to do is to, is to really listen to my constituents, to, to talk a lot less than I listen, and not just to expect them to come to me, but to go out to find them, to have cookies with the council member where I bring the cookies to the homeless shelter or to the laundromat or to the public housing building and try to have genuine conversations where people are actually at and hear their stories. Mr. Askell. St. Paul is a, is a good city. We're a good community. Uh, I don't believe we are racist. I know we're not a racist city. Is racism, does racism exist? Of course it does. Uh, I happen to be a gay man. I came out in 1981 when it wasn't uh, very popular to do so lost friends then, and actually even two last year over it. I tell people that uh, are treated poorly in life, whether it's about their race or any other thing is, just treat people the way you want to be treated and don't worry about what others think of you. And what I'm seeing here for too many years is City's Hall is encouraging you and others to view themselves as victims, to feel aggrieved, and to rely upon them to basically get even for the bad things that may befall you in life. And that's, that's it, thank you. Mr. Butler. Well, I don't think a white person could ever really truly understand racism in this country. I do remember once I was on one of the 
very rare roundabouts in St. Paul, and there was a car coming the wrong way towards me, and we sort of both stopped, and the, the driver was African-American, and I just helpfully said, you're, you're supposed to go to the right on these things, and he said, are you a cop? Mm. And I said, no, and he said, oh, thank you. So um, I can imagine uh, from that one tiny experience that uh, a viewpoint of minorities uh, interacting with any white people in such a situation might uh, raise suspicion to them. And again, that's not something I would ever truly be able to fully understand or appreciate. Uh, starting with Bill, uh, tell me and Andy that you deeply understand poverty and equity. <laughs> that I deeply understand it? Oh my God. Okay, the camera's not left. Now it's lit up, okay. <laughs> my parents divorced when I was one. I rarely saw my father during the course of my childhood. I had an angry drinking stepfather. My mother met at the stockyards and a bar along Concord Street in South St. Paul. Uh, we were the Brady Bunch, but in reverse. There were six kids. The three boys went with dad, the two girls and myself went with mother because I was the infant of the family. Um, <laughs> Our initial home was up on Stryker Avenue. We lived in a rundown duplex up on the upper floor. Fighting and arguing was a daily occurrence between my mother and my stepfather. Fast forward to our next home. It was in the lower part of Indergrove Heights, down along the river. Our basement was full of mud. Rats lived there. Uh, I remember going to school, and we didn't have the money where I could pay for my lunch, so I would stand at the end of the line and you know wait for the free lunch. I don't know if I should be looking at you two or whatever. Later on, my five older, older brothers and sisters all had run-ins with the law. I was kind of the one that broke the mold. So I can relate to a lot of people's experiences. And then further, being self-employed, largely as an artist for 34 years, I've been through my, um, more than my fair share of tough and difficult times. But I'll caveat that with, I encourage young people, when you go through difficult times and life isn't fair, hurdles are sometimes put in front of you, you can always get around it and adversity will build character and strength if you allow it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Butler. Sure. Every year in January, I travel to Honduras with a group from the Twin Cities that are doctors and nurses and non-medical people, but we go to a very poor part of the country. And as you might imagine, just the housing there is very substandard. But what they do is provide ambulatory surgery uh, to these individuals, some of them who have had uh, horrific injuries that their healthcare system is not capable of um, addressing just for a lack of resources. In fact, the hospitals there make you bring the instruments or the implants, you have to buy those and bring them to the hospital. So some of these people have uh, lived with uh, poorly healed fractures and other injuries that would just be inconceivable that individuals here, uh, here in the United States would have to suffer with. So. Um, that level of poverty just makes you realize, frankly, how well off our country is, even at the lowest income levels. I also volunteer down at the Catholic Charities Dorothy Day Center, see a lot of people there, but they are getting great services um, from the center and uh, medical care and all that, too. So um, I compare our poverty to other countries and think, well, we're doing very well. Mr. Butler, you uh, already answered the next question okay. I was going to ask because you can go right to it. Uh, it's to everybody, starting with you. Oh, I didn't get. Oh, my fault. Uh, well, well, thank you. I um, I've been lucky enough not to experience poverty personally, but I've had a number of formative experiences where I've where I've seen it all around me and experienced it in a different way. I taught middle school science in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, after graduating from college during Hurricane Katrina and saw a level of, of poverty and need among my students um, and deprivation that I'd never seen anywhere else. After that, I lived in India and Uganda and once again um, saw the, the huge inequities in those societies and places where, frankly, government couldn't be counted on to make up the difference. You were really on your own. But you don't need to go across the world to see poverty and need and inequities, they're, they're all around us. Um, one of the reasons why I feel so strongly about affordable childcare is because of the conversations I've had with low-income mothers, primarily in my, in my community, who have said, we have our children on wait lists until they reach kindergarten because we can't afford uh, childcare. And, and so to me, that, that level of need is something that is ever-present and something that has to be our top priority. 
Thank you. Okay, so uh, the next question was going to be, we're not going to ask it now because I've got another one in mind. Uh, I was going to ask her about what was the last volunteer activity you engaged in, and there you were talking about uh, being down to earth today. Uh, Ms. Necker, your proposal for child care. Um, Mr. Butler, uh, how, you know what it is and how do you uh, feel about it, and you know that the mayor vetoed it, and it's going to be because of the city council's actions under Ms. Necker's leadership, it's going to be on the ballot in the next, not this year, but in two years. So. What do you think about that proposal to, so that uh, child care providers are getting paid? I do not uh, view child care provision as a city responsibility. I think it's an excellent proposal in terms of the public policy it intends to support in terms of helping those at the youngest ages get the education uh, that they need that will help them for the rest of their lives. But in terms of taking property taxes from some residents to pay for child care for others, it's just not a city responsibility. It's better handled at the state level where the income tax is paid based on your ability to pay, and that's really how we uh, fund a lot of these programs that are uh, providing services to low-income people. You take the money from those who can most afford to pay the taxes to support those who are in the uh, lower incomes who re need those services. And here we're just taxing residents to help other city residents regardless of your ability to pay that property tax. So I am not a supportive of the method of funding this program uh, through the property tax. We're going to reverse it this time. Mr. Hasco, you go next and we'll give Ms. Necker the third on this. Um, uh, with all due respect, Council Member Neeker has been in office going on eight years. Um, this could have been brought up when she first ran for office or even four years ago. Um, politicians, you know, our city's budget is exploding. 500 million 10 years ago, it's approaching 800 million now and it's not going to stop. They just voted another property tax increase, as I mentioned. The metro-wide sales tax has already increased 1%. There's a push to increase it another 1% by the city this fall, and that'll push us to the highest in the state by far, adding another tax upon that. Um, the city's policies are pushing more and more people into poverty because they're making it ever more expensive uh, to live here. Um, politicians are too often, um, they're quite philanthropic when it comes to using others' money. And with all due respect, uh, the incumbent may have considered starting her own foundation to raise money for lower income parents, or frankly, starting a daycare herself. Um, I'm a small business owner for going on 34 years, or starting a small uh, daycare center herself and showing the rest of us how it might be done. Thank you. Is Necker on your proposal? Well, first of all, uh, I have been working on this for seven years, so almost from the first day I was elected. It takes a long time to uh, make this kind of systemic game changing initiative take root. Um, you know, I think the question of what a city does and doesn't do has really been evolving. There are numerous instances where cities across the country have stepped up to do things that cities traditionally haven't done, in part because we can't get action on the state and federal levels anymore on some basic needs. So cities where we are closest to the problem, we're often closest to the solution, and we're often leading the way. Um, <clears throat> there are very few public-private public investments that show the same amount of return that we can see from providing a, a great start to every child, where there are almost none others that I know of that have a $16 to every $1 spent return. Um, so in terms of our economic vitality, making sure parents can get to work, employers can count on a stable workforce, children show up ready for kindergarten, there is no better investment we can make. And for the cost of roughly 50 cents a day at the program's fullest implementation 10 years out, we can make childcare much more affordable and accessible for families in St. Paul. I think that often the way that the state ends up taking action on issues like this is when cities act first. And a great example of that is the smoking ban that is now statewide, but that started with cities like St. Paul, or all day kindergarten, which is now statewide, but started with cities and school districts doing it first. And so I think while ultimately it would be great for this to be a state responsibility, I think this is the way to get there. And I think in the meantime, I would like St. Paul families and employers to be able to benefit from something like this while the state figures out what it wants to do. Thank you. Uh, who has been, a, uh, starting with Rebecca, so uh, who has been a role model for you? <clears throat> um, I have so many role models, but I think I'll, I'll choose my grandmother. Um, she worked full-time at a time when very few women did. 
She valued ideas. She taught me how to love a good argument and not to be afraid of critical thinking, not to think that having a different opinion or pushing back or going back and forth on something was a bad thing, but that was really the, the right way to get to the best solution. Um, she was always dignified. She was a teacher, and best of all, she taught me how to tell a good joke, which is really a vanishing social skill in today's world. Good, thank you. Mr. Haskell. 30 years I've been downtown, as I mentioned, or in St. Paul now with the art gallery. And of all the politicians I've met over the years, I'm not saying she was necessarily a role model, but she was the one I found most attractive, um, great integrity, et cetera. Her name was Bobby Meegard. She was on the city council. It was many years ago. But what I liked about her as far as being a politician, I remember there was an issue that arose, and I wanted to speak to her about it uh, too often. Um, People in City Hall ignore emails and ignore communications. It's quite common, actually. Uh, if I'm elected, it's going to end. But Bobby Meegard, I remember she invited me into her office. She had it beautifully decorated. And you know what she did, ladies and gentlemen? She had a cute little table with two chairs. And she sat down on one side, I sat down on the other. And you know what she said? She said, educate me. Do you know how rare that is to hear from a politician in City Hall, with all due respect? Another real quick one is Kitty Corner from where my gallery was, I just moved out recently, is a Bedgett Avis uh, car rental. And the man who runs it, his name is Hassan, and he came to America from Somalia um, when he was a child. And he works that thing seven days a week. He's got a partner, and he's built it into a fabulous business. He's got a nice, very lovely home in Invergrove Heights, got a nice car, beautiful kid, uh, two kids. He's found the American dream through just sheer hard work and stick to itiveness and Hassan I admire him very much thank you Mr. Butler well my parents uh, set an expectation that people in our family would help contribute somehow to the community do something for others and I, I remember as a pretty young uh, person my mother uh, helping a college classmate who was Vietnamese and they had to flee the country and came to this country with nothing. And she was collecting household items, clothes, and helping them find a place to live. And that has always just stuck in my mind that when you know somebody who is in great need, that you are to be the person to go and help them and do whatever you can for them. And uh, I've always uh, tried to live out that maybe in different ways than my uh, parents did. but. Again, uh, looking for how we can uh, help the community in some way that we think is uh, important. I loved all your answers to that question. So uh, Mr. Hasco, how are you advantaging ranked choice voting in this election? Say, say that one more time. How are you advantaging ranked choice voting in this, your election? How am I advant? How are you using it? What are you doing about it? What do you think about it? Well, I think it should be repealed or, you know, I, I remember when it came for a vote, what was this, how many years ago now, 12, yeah. 16, 14, 12 years ago? Go ahead. I was torn and I actually in the booth, I voted against it because I didn't trust what was being sold uh, as its, its benefits. And I'm, I'm approaching three quarters of the entire ward, uh, visiting every single block and every single house, passing out flyers. I'm having terrific conversations. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but I bet it's 9.9. .9 uh, to point one, people do not like ranked choice voting. And if I'm elected, I want the public, because now that we've had it for a while, I think it'd be fair to have another referendum vote on it. Thank you. Mr. Butler. I am not uh, promoting myself as number one or number two or any other candidate as number one or number two. So I'm just leaving it up to the voters to decide how they want to rank their candidates. Uh, I'm assuming after several elections using ranked voice, vote choice or choice voting, that they understand how that works and uh, will make their own best decision. Ms. Necker. I am a big fan of ranked choice voting. I have been since I first ran in 2015 as a complete outsider, someone who didn't know anything about politics and was a, a real long shot running against the chair of the St. Paul DFL at that time and pretty intimidated by the whole process. Um, I found it encouraging to be able to go up to a door that I either didn't know who was behind it and how they felt because they probably didn't know me or who had a sign for one of my opponents in their front yard 
and still walk up, still knock on that door, still have a conversation, and be able to ask for their second choice vote. Um, I think that that allows us to engage more people rather than immediately assuming it's zero sum and I have to walk away if they might prefer somebody other than me. So I'm continuing to, to do that, to ask people for their first, and if not first, their second choice vote. To the audience out there, just so you understand, when you go to the polls on November 7 or go to do your early voting, starting uh, last week, you could vote already for one of these three, you also get to say, you know, let's suppose that no one gets 50% on the first count of all the ballots, okay? The last place finisher drops off. Whoever that would have been, um, if you had voted for that one who got dropped off, now you're gonna go to your second choice and have that vote count. So you still get to choose even if you voted for the one who loses. So it's important to rank your vote when you go to the polls. Okay. Uh, Peter, starting with Peter, uh, what uh, is your neighborhood safe and what makes a safe neighborhood? I would say it's mostly safe. I live in a condominium on the fourth floor along Grand Avenue, so there have been some incidents after hours, but uh, certainly being on the fourth floor, you're, you're removed from that. I have called a couple of times with suspicious activity that seemed to be occurring, but the police do not respond. And again, they, the 911 operator asks, well, do they have a weapon? So I think that's kind of how they prioritize it. If, it's, if there's no weapon or no assault going on, they're not gonna respond, which I think um, should be corrected. I think whenever uh, individual calls that they should get some sort of response when they feel something suspicious going on. But generally, I feel safe in the neighborhood during the daylight hours and early evenings. I would not be out on my own well after 10 p.m. or so. Um, again, uh, generally safe, but there are people, because it's Grand Avenue, passing through there. And we've actually had uh, more transients, which is not to say um, they're responsible for everything, but they have been able to get into our building during the cold weather, so. Ms. Necker. There have been scary incidents in my neighborhood. There was a shootout at a funeral home just a block from my house. Um, there have been a number of, there's been some large fires um, and, and there's regular sirens coming to properties near my home. But I would answer the question, is my neighborhood safe by saying absolutely it is safe. Even though there are isolated incidents overall, I feel very safe in my neighborhood and I feel that way because my neighborhood is busy, it's full. Um, I live next to, a, renters on one side, homeowners on the other side, across the street from a church, across the street from a nursing home, across the street from a library. Um, there's constant activity around me and, and on my block and in my neighborhood. And I think that that presence, that positive activity or neutral activity is ultimately what makes a neighborhood not only feel safe, but also be safe with all of those additional eyes on the street and people able to, to look out for one another. Thanks. So now the next question is, oh, I just keep jumping ahead. Mr. Haskell. You didn't want my answer, did you? No, no, let's hear. <laughs> okay, I just moved out of downtown. I was there for 30 years. We just had two more murders in this city, so I think we're approaching having a record number of murders four years in a row. There's not many cities that can equal that, with all due respect, and I love this town. Pomeroy's Animal Hospital, uh, half a block from my gallery, windows were broken. Uh, they, bro they stole drugs inside. Hassan, my friend Hassan across the street, had his windows broken twice. A uh, woman was raped at Mears Park Apartments, what, two years ago? Uh, the uh, Metro Square across the street, uh, what, six months ago, somebody hid away within the building during the day when the public was in there, and they stole a bunch of computers all night long. Uh, the parking ramp where my gallery was, they just had a, this, this is the, the week that I moved out here several weeks ago. Drug bust in the ramp at 11 o'clock at night. A bunch of guys were in there. Multiple squads showed up. Two nights later, I had to call the police again. Somebody had broken and entered the uh, closed alley bar in the middle of the block. Uh, fentanyl, uh, across the street from me, Katie Corner where my gallery was. Uh, uh, it's called Safe Zone. It's a... It's a, it's a uh, kind of a, a, a day gathering place for at-risk youth, whether they're teens to young adults, which that mix is, is actually quite poor. Uh, f smoking fentanyl, ladies and gentlemen, fentanyl outside a county building. And I think the city council just enacted a law where you're not supposed to smoke cigarettes in a city park, but there's kids smoking fentanyl in front of this, uh, 
safe zone downtown. And one last thing, police that I talk to, they say they are discouraged from writing police reports. So the full value of the crimes that are happening, it appears we're not actually hearing all of the details. Uh, if I'm elected, uh, and you do need to elect me, uh, things can change. Thank you. Very good, okay. So th this question is rather nuanced, um, and uh, it's a long one. I'm gonna read it all, and we start with Ms. Necker on the answer. So how will you work to reconcile the reality that people living in different parts of the city have had different lived experiences regarding public safety? How will you work for solutions that are citywide inclusive and reflect the multiple lived experiences? That is a great question, and I think the, the nuance that's captured in that question is really the nuance of public safety. Um, I think because people have such different experiences throughout the city, we need a variety of approaches to ensuring public safety. There, there's just not one tool that's going to do it. And frankly, cities all across the country have been battling with higher levels of violent crime recently, and, and that crime has not just stemmed from the current moment. It has evolved over time due to lots of factors that aren't gonna be cleared up overnight. Um, but I'm proud of the work that we're doing, even though we have a lot more work to do. We are using data-driven approaches to preventing crime, like the Group Violence Intervention Program, which focuses on the very small number of people in our community who commit the vast majority of the crime. So focusing on them with support and also focusing on them with deterrence. We have specific interventions that can go to, to meet the need in the moment rather than just having a police officer with a gun. We need to have a fully funded police department and I have voted over and over for additional funding to make sure our police department is fully staffed throughout the year with a second police academy so we can keep our staffing constant. But it's not always the best use of a police officer or the best response to send them to every call. So we have crisis intervention trained officers now. We have a homeless assistance response team that tracks every single encampment in the city, builds relationships with people in those encampments and helps them move into housing, and on and on. And that's, that's just responding to the crime that exists now. In addition to that, we have the full range of upstream services trying to make sure that the best crime prevention tool is making sure people have a job and a home and access to education. And those are all of the other pieces of the work that we're doing every day. So I think having all of those different tools at our disposal is the way to respond to the fact that crime looks and is experienced differently throughout the city. Mr. Asko. You know, this past spring, a this past spring, a survey came out. I think the public schools uh, uh, did it. It was published in the Pioneer Press. I think 35% of school staff said they did not feel safe within the public school system. And they went to the high school level, and that was 55% said they did not feel safe. I mean, look what we've, look what we've come to in this city. Uh, the shoplifting has become normalized. It's just become common now. And buses, I've been, I've been a... In my little file here, I have some uh, transfers for buses. I've been using public transit for 30 years. Five, six years ago, they retrofitted every single public bus in this city and in the metropolitan area with doors to protect the drivers from assault. Uh, Light Rail, the Federal Transportation Administration in 2022 came out with statistics. The Twin Cities Light Rail System is the least safe in America by far. Um, with all due respect, the incumbent's been in office nearly eight years now, ladies and gentlemen. It's time for somebody new. And the final thing I want to say is the police chief, for I don't know how long, has been selected by the mayor, if I understand things correctly, and then the city council hires the chief. And I was at a meeting, a crime meeting, a week ago with uh, the, new, the new chief, and um, I was watching him having to be careful in how he was responding to answers. And I think what we've come to do now is that the chief should be in an elected position. Uh, it's nothing that had been on my mind, but I think I'm sensing the chief is having to operate too much under the thumbs of the mayor and the city council, with all due respect. And if I'm elected, we're going to have a referendum that allows you, ladies and gentlemen, to decide whether or not you should be hiring the police chief in the future through a vote. Thank you. Mr. Butler. So in terms of equity, we certainly have areas of the city that really suffer from a lot of crime, particularly the east side. There was the very, very sad uh, shooting of a 14-year-old girl. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the only time this has happened on the east side. There's a lot of crime over there. So as a council member, I would expect that the city would put its resources into the areas that have the highest uh, violent crime or repeat crime. 
certain other parts of the city are much more safer, uh, and they should also be uh, covered in services, have the same coverage, but I really think the uh, police department needs to allocate more resources to those higher crime areas rather than I believe they sort of spread out almost equally the uh, number of officers during uh, various shifts. I was uh, working, I work at home and one day three po police cars were racing down Grand Avenue uh, towards downtown. I don't know what the call was, but it just shows you how spread out our do on duty police officers are during any given shift that they are spread out across the city. And I think, uh, again, I would also uh, rely on the police chief and commander's uh, judgments in terms of how to allocate resources, but would certainly support more of those resources in the higher crime area, uh, which typically also correlates with the lower income uh, situations. Starting with Mr. Hosko, what have you personally done to curb gun violence? And if elected, what actions will you take? I mean, th this is an interesting subject because uh, when Mayor Carter was running for mayor the first time, uh, his house was broken into during the daytime, if I remember correctly. And uh, he had uh, two, maybe three guns. How many was it? Two? Two? Two guns. My understanding, they were unsecured and unregistered guns. Uh, it's pretty, and at the time he had four children in his household. Uh, to me, that's pretty serious. And uh, again, the incumbent was in office then, and we didn't hear anything about that. We're hearing a lot about the need for gun safety now, but with all due respect, Mayor Carter was a textbook case uh, about how not to own a gun. Thank you. Mr. Butler. Mr. Butler. Other than never owning a firearm, I have not in any manner uh, taken action to prevent gun violence. I uh, respect people's right to own firearms. And uh, even though I am not a proponent of uh, gun ownership and would certainly support any effort that the city would find uh, effective in reducing gun violence, a very, very complicated uh, issue in terms of the flow of guns into and out of the city. It's a very fluid situation. A lot of this is gang related. And so um, trying to address those uh, major sources of gun violence would be uh, obviously the most appropriate thing, but I think it would also be a multi-jurisdictional effort with the uh, federal agencies as well. Ms. Necker. I have been a strong champion of the focused deterrence group violence intervention model that I mentioned earlier that's been proven to work in cities across the country. Even when members of the administration in the city were not as bought into the idea, I was working with Ramsey County Attorney's Office and other law enforcement partners to try to get federal funding to make that a reality, and now it is. Um, I would also point to my work on the safe storage ordinance. I was really proud to work with Moms Demand Action to require that guns be stored safely so that they don't fall into the hands of children in particular or people who are um, intent on self-harm or people who are intending to harm others. Uh, so that that's an ordinance that we passed just a few months ago. It's not everything, but it's a small step in the right direction, and I am I'm proud of the collaborative work we did on that. Thank you. Uh, to the audience, uh, uh, there's going to be some questions that we don't ask here that are important. Uh, you need to go to look at their question and responses. For example, I'm not going to ask the rent control question right now um, because I want to get to this one. And it's another long question. Listen carefully. I'm not going to read it a second time. Um, as a city council member, you will be making decisions on the financial health of the city government services and resources. You will not only make decisions regarding the city's annual budget and property tax rate, but also its borrowing power and government bond rating. These are all aspects of the city's fiscal integrity, its ability to raise money to pay for the public services it provides. One important financial tool the city uses is tax increment financing, or TIF. This is a financial tool that a city can use when A, an area is declared to be blighted, and B, when a developer can certify that a development project would not go forward but for the tax increment financing. Here's how it works. When a community designates properties as a TIF district, the property value of those properties 
at that point in time are designated as the base value. <clears throat> then for a set amount of years, usually 20 to 25 years, the property taxes take taxes over and above that base value goes into a separate fund so the city can incentivize or give a grant to a developer to allow that developer to reduce the amount of equity the developer must bring to the table. The city sells TIF bonds to borrow the projected increased property tax money up front to grant to the developer for the development project. When the development project is completed, the increase in property taxes over the base amount is used to pay off the bonds. My question, what do you see as the pros and cons of using this financial tool in the short term to aid private development and in the long term as it affects the city's financial health? I believe Mr. Butler is first. Sure. First of all, I'm a opponent of tax increment financing. I don't believe it uh, provides a sustainable economic development for the city of St. Paul. The pro for the short term is, yes, there's a nice boost in construction work, jobs, maybe new residents coming in, but the cost of doing that is just too great for the benefit received. I want to talk about the former Ford site. Um, Mr. Dawkins mentioned that development wouldn't, would not have occurred but for the tax increment financing. The city must hire a company to make that determination, and those companies always come back and say, yes, this development will not happen without tax increment financing. And to say some uh, primary location like the Ford site would not have developed without TIF is really uh, disingenuous. And what also happens is the city uh, sets a total dollar amount for the TIF uh, revenues the Ford site is 225 million, about 100 million or so is actually going for the development of the site itself. The other 100 and some million is going to be allocated to other projects around the city. Some of it's gonna be for affordable housing or other issues. So these are, uh, tax increment finance is a way for the city to generate taxes for other areas and other projects unrelated to the original project. And this uh, affects not only the property taxes you pay as a city resident, it also affects uh, the county property tax levy because we are removing tax uh, value or tax base from all taxing districts that um, you pay taxes towards. So again, the city benefits short term, but it's a very unsustainable tool. Uh, $9 million to refurbish the Landmark Center Tower for maybe 100 residents residential units, that's just way too much money uh, for one project, and you cannot expect to underwrite every project to that extent. Thank you. Ms. Necker. The downside of tax increment financing is that dollars that would be available to us in the form of property taxes in the future are being used to pay back the development that's occurred rather than being used for services. And that's why it's so important that tax increment financing be used very sparingly. Um, I was one of the folks, for example, who spoke out against uh, TIF being used on the Midway Alliance Field development site because the site had already received exemptions from property taxes into the future and it was intended to be a catalyst for the rest of the area and I didn't feel tax increment financing made sense there. But there are times when developments aren't going to happen unless they get additional subsidy. A really good example of that is affordable housing, which is the primary use that we have used tax increment financing for in my time on the council. So we have the choice to either provide that subsidy by taking it out of our current resources, which often means either raising taxes or decreasing services because we only have a certain amount of money available to us right now, or taking from the future taxes that will be generated by the property over and above what we're getting now and being able to use that future source over time to pay back the project, which doesn't affect the people uh, who are currently in St. Paul now taking out of uh, their tax base. So I think it has to be used sparingly. We have a citywide policy that only 10% of our taxable value can be in a tax increment district at any time. And I think that's a really important safeguard to make sure that we realize the advantages and don't realize the disadvantages. Thank you. Mr. Haskell in this area, but this is rare. I agree with Peter and Rebecca. I mean, they both have valid valid points. I like being around other people that excel in areas that I don't. I love asking questions, and if I'm elected, I want Peter nearby me. <laughs> it seems like everything that happens in St. Paul, there needs to be some sort of subsidy. If we're such a 
happy, healthy, and vibrant city. I mean, there shouldn't need to be all these subsidies. Uh, it's, it's, um, I, I'm thinking of all these projects in my 30 years, you know, Galter Plaza, Bandana Square, the World Trade Center. I think there was a lot of public money involved and every single one of them ended up not being what they were d d designed to be, you might say. Uh, that said, I would be amenable to TIF, but just purely on a case-by-case -case basis um, and, and sparingly and grudgingly, you might say. Thank you. Starting with uh, Ms. Necker, does Grand Avenue need a plan, and uh, what would it be? I love plans, so I believe every place needs a plan. I think Grand Avenue needs a plan. I think that plan should focus on revitalizing the small scale and ideally local retail that we've been missing along Grand for a long time. Um, and that luckily is not work that the city has to do from inside City Hall. It's work that has already begun, led by the Summit Hill Association and the Grand Avenue Business Association. Um, a whole task force was formed called the Future is Grand Task Force, so it even had a spiffy name. Uh, and I, I'm excited to see how that work moves forward, but I definitely think it, it would benefit from a plan that focuses on retail. So, go ahead, Mr. Rascal. I don't know that there needs to be a plan. It seems to me there was uh, maybe, uh, yeah, I'll, I defer to uh, Rebecca Neeker, or Council Member Neeker. Wasn't there a push to put parking meters on Grand Avenue that not that many years ago? And I was adamantly against it. And I think Rebecca may have been in favor of it and then backed out of it later on. Um, I'll give you 15 seconds to answer that real quick. Ms. Necker, go ahead. Uh, this was all before I took office, and I believe that I was listening to community and that I was, uh, I believe my, I was not in favor of parking meters on Grand, but honestly, it was a long time ago and I don't remember. And I wasn't in office at the time. We had election season though, that year, but regardless. Uh, admittedly, I was against parking meters at the time. Uh, the buses that go up and down Grand Avenue, again, they have the doors on and protect the drivers from the salt. You know, it used to be fun to go up to Grand Avenue and now, you know, the, the ridership on the bus is going up to Grand Avenue's plummeted. It used to be full of families and kids and senior citizens. Now they're hardly on it anymore. Uh, you can drive up to Grand Avenue or bike up to Grand Avenue or walk up there like I'm a big walker. Grand Hill, a lot of that's public property. It's an absolute mess. Uh, the, the railings all chip the paint. Weeds everywhere. Trees growing out of sidewalk cracks. The, the sidewalks are uneven. This is city and public property, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> Incumbent's been here for seven years. It's never looked so bad. Uh, and then they keep raising the property taxes on these properties. They just did it again two weeks ago. I mean, they're, they're making it ever harder for small businesses to survive up there because the landlords have to keep raising their leases in order to, uh, you know, navigate the, the property tax increases. So if anything, we just need to slow these tax increases uh, to, 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 to just a minimum. Clean up the public property going up to Grand Avenue. Clean up the buses. And basically just leave the people alone and they'll, they'll, they'll do their own thing and they'll do it well. Thank you. Mr. Butler. Sure. So 50 years ago, Grand Avenue was in a pretty sorry state and certain community members came forward and really uh, revived it. And I think that's would be the uh, situation now. In terms of the city's role, I think it needs to focus more on the crime prevention and making sure that the avenue is welcoming and people feel safe. There's a restaurant bar that seems to keep getting its liquor license extended despite numerous uh, issues or events there. I think that uh, should be revisited. But um, in terms of uh, the street itself, Still a lot of the longtime tenants that are anchoring that area are there. There's certainly some vacancies that could be filled. And whatever community plan comes forward, I think the city's role there is to help make sure Grand Avenue is uh, safe for people to come to and the street is hopefully repaired soon and well lighted uh, to make it uh, an attractive place to come and also for businesses to locate there. Mr. Asko, is the uh, former Schmidt Brewery project a bust? And if so, why and how can the city help? You know, when I've, I've left flyers in the building, um, the housing portion, ladies and gentlemen, if you've not seen it, it's extraordinary. And everybody knows I'm, I can be kind of a, a critical when it comes to design and architecture. They did an extraordinary job. Go there during an art crawl. It's, it's, it's lovely. The retail component uh, has frequently or largely struggled. 
Um, it, I think it suffers the same fate. There's no other major attraction around it, so it's kind of an island as far as a destination attraction. Uh, the same thing happened with Bandana Square, maybe not to that extent. And it's a tough one. Again, the, the bus service outside, it's not safe and friendly like it used to be. The neighborhood overall, it's, it's a solid neighborhood. It's good. The retail component, I have an idea for it. I'm not, I guess I'm not really prepared to share right now. But the one thing I will say is there's a small vacancy there. And uh, there needs to be a police precinct, I think, in that area because the nearest ones, if I'm correct, are, e are north northeast of downtown and on North Dale Street. Is that correct? And there's not one western? Okay, but it's northwestern? It's up near Hamlin. That's a ways away, ladies and gentlemen. There needs to be a precinct to serve not only West 7th Street, but the, the Highland Park area as well. Thank you. Mr. Butler. Well, it's certainly been successful in preserving the facility and bringing back some use to it. Uh, I remember it used to be an ethanol plant, which was the major reason that it, um, it was now converted. Uh, the ethanol plant itself was shut down. Um, I mean, the problem is we also have this, this ham brewery is how do we try and save these uh, historic uh, architectural um, buildings and give them a proper self-sustaining use and that often isn't possible or compatible. So I think in terms of the city's uh, role in that, they have to make a decision on whether this particular property is worth uh, redeveloping and will it be self-sustaining rather than just saying this is part of our city heritage, but it's not going to be financially uh, feasible to reoccupy or reuse that building for some other purpose. Ms. Decker. I would agree with my worthy opponents that from a, a historic preservation and a housing standpoint, it's been a smashing success. It's uh, disappointing on the keg and case front, um, for sure. I think that was largely the result of, uh, frankly, COVID coming at exactly the wrong time for that, for that use. Um, it was so promising, number one food hall in the U.S., according to USA Today, and then, and then COVID couldn't have come at a worse time. The city can help um, in two ways, as it, as it always can when it comes to business development. One is financial. We've already put over a million dollars, which was something I fought hard for, in American Rescue Plan dollars into the building um, just to help it make it through after COVID. Um, but the other thing that we can do, and that's even more important, I think, is helping businesses reconfigure their licensing structure and navigate the bureaucracy both at City Hall and at the state level to make sure that they have a plan that works. One of the biggest issues with a food hall like Keg and Case is figuring out the logistics of your liquor license, which is how almost all other food halls that are successful allow you to take your liquor, walk around, visit all the other shops, and have that all be an experience that's one of a piece. And that's been something that because of regulatory issues at the state, Keg and Case has struggled with. So I was just on a call last week with the potential new owner and our regulatory team, and we're already trying to work with them and be proactive to help them resolve those issues so they can be operationally successful. Thanks. Okay, so we're getting close to the time where we're going to end the forum, and uh, we'll start with the closes in a minute. But I just want to tell the audience again that there's so many more questions that I'd love to have asked tonight. Uh, we'll talk about rent control, talk about the Summit Avenue bikeway. There's so many important issues that the voters need to pay attention to when they vote. The candidates have different stances on those, but you need to go to their questionnaire responses. Go to stpaulstrong.com, all one word, stpaulstrong, one word, dot com, and see what they had to say because they have different views on those very important issues. Educate yourselves before you go to the polls. Okay, uh, we're going to do closes, and we start uh, with Mr. Butler. One minute. All right. First of all, thank you to SPNNN and St. Paul Strong for hosting this forum, helping to educate voters, and uh, for the role St. Paul Strong has uh, uh, had for a number of years in hoping to keep our government transparent and accountable. I would encourage uh, voters to certainly show up to the polls. This is probably the most significant election in recent St. Paul history, not just with uh, four open council seats, but also the $1 billion sales tax. All the candidates here uh, undoubtedly love our city. We all have different perspectives on the role of city government. So I would just encourage voters to learn as much as possible and decide which uh, candidate might fit your um, viewpoint best. But again, this is a historic 
uh, election for City of St. Paul. So thank you again to our moderators and St. Paul Strong for this opportunity. Very good, Ms. Nick. Yes, thank you so much to SPNN and to St. Paul Strong for this forum. It's been a, a great conversation and I really appreciate the nuanced questions. Um, it's been the honor of my life to represent Ward 2 for the last eight years and I have to tell you that I wake up every morning really early, really excited to get to work. I am the opposite of jaded, the opposite of cynical. I believe even more strongly in the power of local government than I did when I first ran, and I wanna keep working hard for you. And I will say also that we've heard a lot of concerns tonight, a lot of complaints about how things are done, but we also need ideas and we need results. And I have a record of getting both, and I hope I can earn your support. Thanks, Mr. Haskell. It's been a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, I like your format, this is, this is interesting. The, uh, uh, a month ago, there was a candidate for League of Women Voters in this very same spot. I asked the question, uh, would my two opponents pledge to fulfill the four-year term we're applying for? And I like Peter just said, this is a historic election. I like that, Peter. <laughs> it's, uh, and I put up my hand and I said, I pledge to serve the four full years and that I, unequivocally, I will not run for county or state office. Uh, sadly, neither one of my opponents raised their hand at that time. I was the only one. Uh, Ms. Necker at the time also mentioned there was, I'm paraphrasing, negativity and pessimism uh, during that, uh, that debate, and she just alluded to it a little bit now. It's like, this is a candidate forum. It is an election. I mean, we, people, it's okay to challenge politicians when they're running for re-election, and uh, if I'm elected, I want people to challenge me and I want people to question me. My entire life is so much better because of it. Thank you. Very good. You know, great debate, everyone. Uh, go vote, everybody. There you go. You got your All right. Candidates. Thank you so much. Nice job. Oh.